Greetings, I'm Ann Huang, Executive Director of World Arts West. Tonight, we're very excited to launch season three of Living Traditions, Exploring Dance Beyond the Performance. If you like what you see this evening, please consider making a donation to World Arts West. Enjoy the program. Here is San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival Co-Artistic Director, Latanya Tigner. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Greetings. My name is Latani D. Tickner, co-artistic director of the San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival. We'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging that the Bay Area is contemporarily known as Ohlone territory. There are eight language dialects and many active tribal groups. We acknowledge San Francisco Bay as the territory of the Yamalu Ramatush Ohlone. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ethnic Dance Festival Co-Artistic co Director, Mahalani Uchiyama. Thank you, LaTanya. And welcome to Living Traditions, exploring dance beyond the performance. With this program, World Arts West aspires to lead our audience on a journey that explores various dance disciplines through a series of online interviews. Our conversations with artists will focus on their art form, its history, and what makes it unique. Each episode will focus on one company or individual and a specific tradition. We will discuss how they find balance between holding tradition and embracing innovation. Additionally, we want to give you the opportunity to ask questions of the artists, as well as a demonstration from the tradition that they practice. Today, we will be interviewing award-winning dancer, musician, and educator, Eddie Madrill. A member of the Pasquayaki tribe, Eddie represents his culture through his work as a playwright, filmmaker, and host of the radio show Bay Native Circle. He is also the artistic director of Sewam American Indian Dance. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey,
I am delighted today to welcome Eddie Madrill. Thank you, thank you, Latanya, and thank you, uh, Maham, and thank you to World Arts West and everybody there and all the different ethnic dance groups and dancers and, and uh, performers and musicians, everybody I like. So, uh, Leo Sanchanyavo, um, thank you for having me. Before we enter into our conversation, we'd like to encourage you, our audience, to consider a donation to World Arts West. And also, we would love for you to put your, um, your questions in the chat so we can get to those a little later in the program. Thank you. First question. Hi, Eddie. Well, hello. It's good to see you. So, yes, fellow Libran. Um, <laughs> Uh, the first question, um, which is, I think is, is very important as we, you know, just had a chance to chat about it, is like, what does Sewam mean? Very good question. Um, it's funny because we travel around a little bit here and there and nobody ever asks, they just want to see the dance, which is great, which is great. I mean, there's a lot of different ethnic dance groups with very um, traditional names and, uh, you know, using words from their language. So Sewam is a plural form of Sewa. And Sewa is flower, so Sewam is flowers. And in our language, the Yaki language, the Yoema language, the Hiaki language, Hiaki language, um, it's Sewam, that means flowers, but we come, our original people, the, the Surim, the little people under the ground, like little people in you know many places around the world, um, they come from different worlds. So we come from different worlds. And one of those worlds is the Sewa Ania, which is the flower world. We also have the Huya Ania, which is a, the, the enchanted world. So Sewa is flowers, and when we go to dance and we perform, what we really want to do isn't perform per se, it's to share, to bring awareness, and to bring empathy um, between cultures, not for us, but between cultures, whether it's ethnic, social, religious, uh, modern, whatever it may be. And so we believe that in what we're doing, we're trying, in, in essence, um, to use flowers, to use beauty, to do away with the evil. And that evil can be interpreted as just, you know, uh, misconception, misunderstanding, um, uh, misinterpretation, uh, preconceived notion, all those different things, prejudice. So Sewam means flowers. Beautiful, beautiful. That's such a, such a um, humanitarian way, you know, to address and to address uh, differences and conflict, potential conflict. Um, I have another um, question behind that in terms of like language um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the connection to the dance and the, and the music and, and what is that relationship in terms of like what you speak and what you sing um, and sure. what you dance and what you dance. Ooh, how long do we have? We have less than <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, if we have a semester, that's good. But let me see if I could do it within a couple of minutes. Um, and you know, and that's and your question really comes from a place of, of sincerity for any, you know, almost any ethnic, you know, group, ethnic dance group, uh, traditional group. Um, you know, the words that are being sung, uh, especially for powwow. So a lot of what we do is powwow style dancing um, on stage and performance. Uh, many powwow style dances are what we can do socially um, without. You know, re repercussion without uh, you know uh, recourse without um, offending. Many of the dances, almost ninety to ninety nine percent of the dances of American people, Native people, are ceremonial. So you're not going to see them, or they might be open to public, but not. I mean, it's really really complicated. So with about five hundred and seventy six tribes now, and that number fluctuates. So I just say around five hundred and seventy six. Uh, tribes, you're talking about, you know, hundreds of dances, hundreds of songs, you know, close to 200 languages. But the language in any culture really um, is what represents your feelings. So you have ha, ka, ma, wa, all these ah sounds that come out from almost any language, almost, but many of the languages that I've, uh, I've been able to um, come across in meeting people in a humanitarian or human way, um, ah is a very, uh, you know, it's a very um, spiritual sound. And when people come to a powwow and they hear that northern singing, da -da, you know, it's really, really loud and high pitched. What they don't realize is that some people uh, believe that that music, that song is the very first voice that comes from a child in entering into the world. So in essence, every time we dance, we are reemerging. We are 
um, it's it's a it's a new world every single day. So it's like world renewal for the individual. And when we come together as a community, that's world renewal for the community. Um, and so the words are oftentimes uh, poetic, spiritual. Um, they, they represent our environment and our environment tells us what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, um, how we're going to celebrate, how many, you know, uh, what kind of clothes we're going to have. And that environment exists around us, above us and below us. So our outfits, everything that we wear comes from our environment and represents the environment in essence. So a lot of the geometric shapes that come from basket weaving or beadwork, geometric shapes aren't just a bunch of triangles. They represent mountains, clouds, insects, you know, uh, lightning. I mean, all these different things. Um, and so in, in, in answering your question about language, you know, the, the, the complexity and the conflict between two worlds 500 years ago or now is how we use a language like English to define and describe our relationship amongst each other because we have to. It's the, the national language, let's say. But it doesn't give any worth or value to what it means to us. So if I were to ask somebody, um, you know, what is the difference between land, home, property, real estate? You know, there are all kinds of different interpretations. But for an American Indian, it's going to be this. And it's from the center of the earth to the creator, all of those things. It's the roots. Um, it's kind of like asking somebody to, to tell a joke in one language that's really funny to everybody and ask them to you know, uh, translate it into English for me. And it's not funny because it doesn't have the cultural context. Um, and so your, your, your question is a very, very good and profound question. Um, I think it's a, it requires a lengthier answer. But I would probably say that for any question you're going to ask tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's, let's let's keep on the roll with that one. Um, with regard to your um, mentioning about the um, symbols that are worn in your regalia, um, it, it might surprise some of our viewers to learn that what you wear during performance is not considered a costume, right? It's it, it's regalia. It represents views of the universe or respect for the elders or um, at, uh, would you tell us a little bit about the difference between uh, what what is regalia for right. those who don't know and, and sure. sure sure you know um, again in that interpretation when we're going to use a language that's that's pseudo universal here in the United States we're going to communicate in English um, we don't want to use the word costume because that interpretation means and depicts wearing something to pretend to be something that you're not. So we wear costumes for, you know, costume parties, for um, for Halloween, for other things to mimic, to uh, represent something. But when we are wearing what we are wearing, we are native. We are dancing the dance. We're not memorizing the dance. We're not um, rehearsing the dance. We're not you know, making the dance um, according to our teacher who told us to do it this way. We are, um, we embody the responsibility and obligation of being native. And what that means is if I go and perform as a native person in the East Coast, in you know, the, the South Bay, in Europe, I represent all American Indian people, whether I like it or not, because I might be the first and only person you ever meet. Therefore, you met an authentic. I must know everything. I said everything the right way, and I know exactly what the right answer is to everything, and that's just impossible. And so when we dance, I'm hoping that the dancers that we, I, I shouldn't say I'm hoping, the dancers that we have that dance with us, you know, I respect greatly. We all might not be the best dancers in the country with, you know, uh, championship, you know, competitions and stuff, but they all know what they're doing and why they're doing it. And they do it in a good way. And they make every effort to respect and honor the elders and the, um, the people from a long time ago that brought these, you know, and kept these for us through imprisonment, through boarding schools, through, you know, uh, annihilation, through removal, through relocation, all these different things that my ancestors did in order for me to have this dance. And now I get to dance in public wearing braids and earrings and beadwork and get applauded. There, I think there's more of a responsibility and obligation to remember humbly that dances from around the world aren't always wanted by their country. And that includes Europe as well um, and Africa and South America and, you know, Southeast Asia and Asia. And so, um, you know, 
we don't use costume. It, 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 it automatically gives somebody the idea that um, we treat it as a costume and that it's something that we put on to pretend or it's only when we're going to play Indian. Um, unfortunately, you go somewhere like France and costume means suit. So then you can't get a little too, you know, <laughs> bent out of shape about it. It's like, well, if they say costume, it might mean suit. So it might be like, even more formal than regalia. It's really, really hard. We're talking about language like Latanya was asking about. And, uh, but here in the States, let's call it regalia. I love that answer. I love that answer. <laughs> nice. It's the best I can um, do. No, it was great. It was great. And so the nuance, the nuance of the language, um, like you said, um, mm, you know, English uh, doesn't always. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go no, ahead. No, and you, when you say nuance, I mean that that brings up another thing, which is, you know, when I was growing up in the '70s, um, it wasn't as it wasn't as prevalent as before that time, but you can go to a POW in the 70s and see which colors a person is using in their regalia and know which tribe or which uh, region they're from. You can see um, which feathers, how they uh, work their feathers. I don't want to say decorate because that's the wrong wrong term, but how they work their feathers, how they, uh, have their how they have their feathers represent them and which order they put them in can tell you which tribe or which society, which honor society, gourd society, warrior society they might be part of. The designs also could be very tribal, also very uh, clan-based, family-based. Um, the designs with colors are also, you can say, oh, that person's Blackfoot, you know, that person's Choctaw, um, and they come from this uh, clan or this family and that, you know, um, they're, they're medicine people. I can tell by these certain symbols, they're medicine people, they're, they're to be highly regarded. Um, so the nuance just, it, it's it's, I don't want to say never ending, but it keeps going and going. Mm -hmm. That's it, wonderful. It, yeah. it, it, it so it totally reflects the the concept of the universe in in in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, the, the yes. environment that one occupies and what what is available. Yes, absolutely. I mean, again, I, I'm going to keep saying this. I'm going to try not to say it all the time, but just like many cultures around the world, maybe that'll be the last time I say it. I think we got it right. We didn't have books. We didn't have um, these written things to tell us what to do. You lived it. So, you know, religion is what you lived. Education is what you lived. Uh, agriculture is what you lived. Hunting is what you lived. Um, geology, geography, all those things you lived. So they were in the stories, they were in the songs, they were in the dances. Everything was story. They were in the designs. I mean, everything was education. So kids, didn't go to school. They didn't have some kind of formal written, you know, textbooks. They didn't have any of these things, but you could, I mean, it's just like, you know, learning fables or um, uh, parables and things like this, or poetry, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Brothers Grimm stories, you know, all these different things. There's information in all of these things, but we tend to just kind of uh, reside to the surface level information and say, I know those stories, I got it. Canterbury Tales, I got it. African Dance, I got it. You know, yeah, I've seen it. But then there's the underlying depth of the unobserved aspect of culture, the unobservable aspect of culture. When you see the fantastic spectacle, when you see the awesome dancing up on stage or at a ceremony, what you don't know is that the ceremony has been going on for six months already. You just didn't see that part. It's been going on for 48 hours already. You just didn't see that part because what you want to see is a fantastic the preparation isn't so fantastic, but that's the most profound or that's the most meaningful. Um, you know, here we have our, our lives in the city or in the country and, you know, we're working on this and working on that. Everything's a profession and art and stuff. And we forget that the most important thing that we can do is drink water and we, we and take care of it because we need to drink it. And we forget that water is, is as I said, you know, water is life. So it's sometimes the most simple things that uh, we forget and I think that's what's beautiful about, uh, you know, traditional dance, um, ethnic dance, music, um, storytelling, you know, even cartoons and stories for kids, because they're all the, the morals and ethics that we're supposed to remember as adults. But we think that those are for the children and we forget that they're for us to become adults with wisdom and wit. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That, yes. that reminded me as you were speaking, um, uh, you, when you talked about um, things happening long before you witness the spectacle of it. Mm. And, and that speaks to ritual, you know, the rituals of the, 
the things you know we experience on the on a, as a part of our daily lives in terms of like the culture and the unseen and the um the depth you know the ritual of that takes a long time to get to the that moment you discussed right and um and it's very valued it, it reminds me of the um you know the the process over product right you know you're in that that ritual is the important part. The product, you know, at the end of it, yes, but it's like going through that process is what uh, the, you know, sustains and maintains the culture. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. and you guys know that in the Ethnic Dance Festival auditions, you know, the, the, the panelists are given information and what the audience doesn't see is, okay, these outfits, these costumes, this regalia was handmade in this island over in you know the Philippines by certain people that were designated to and the and then it came over here and I mean all the things and like you said even the preparation it came here partially done but the people here had to also put their hands into it so that everybody's hands and layers of of worlds and layers of you know generational ages and things like that are all put into the outfit so that when they dance they're not representing the movement they're representing the culture that's embedded within what they wear, which is very soulful. And you can't perform soulful that an audience who's not familiar with dance can actually take in. An audience that's not familiar with dance wants to see the dance. And so the holding still really slow for some dance groups or individuals. Everybody's like, what is that? And you're like, if you're a dancer, you know, that's hard. <laughs> you know, um, it's just that language. Uh, it's it's like the professional or academic language. You learn everything about you know science, or you learn everything about art. But it's a whole language that you learn. Yeah. Beautiful. Nice. So, how is it for the community now that we're entering into uh, our second year, where uh, powwows are being uh, canceled, events are, are not happening uh, for a community that um, for all of our communities, we're, we're, we're so needful of being with one another. What what can you speak to about what's happening with the native community? Well, you, you know, um, the series is called Living Traditions and um, it's appropriate for what I'm about to say, which is, you know, I've done some, some work that was considered modern, um, not cutting edge for American Indian communities, too much, or maybe it was, I don't know. Um, but, you know, having a traditional outfit with, you know, lights on it, having a traditional outfit and doing traditional dance, but to like, you know, uh, EDM music, right? Uh, DJ music on stage at a music festival. Why would you do that? Um, and it's a longer story why I agreed to, to, to dance, you know, on a big music festival stage. I mean, it took a long time and it did take a lot of prayer. Um, and many people could tell you that I was calling them going, I need to talk to you. Um, but there's a reason why, you know, that's done. And it's because, you know, many people when they're looking for the American Indian and you show up looking like me right now and, you know, a t-shirt and hair, yeah, slick back and I'm, I'm in a, a garage dance studio. That's not Indian enough. I need, I need what I'm used to. And what people are used to is what they're given and what they're given when they're not looking for it is what's in the, in the school books or the history books. So the authentic Indian to many people is the one that's from the 1800 for you know 1800s you know photographs but a living tradition is what changes all throughout time i mean when we take a look at american Indian people and today and say well you know that's not traditional it's like well what you consider traditional 100 years ago wasn't traditional and what they were doing 100 years ago wasn't traditional before that we're wearing you know in this image right here you see you know cotton satin silver glass beads um you know uh yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. And, you know, beads weren't necessarily traditional. Uh, you know, beadwork wasn't traditional. Satin wasn't traditional. You know, satin ribbons weren't traditional. But we we take them in. We make, we. it's kind of like acculturation, right? We take some ideas that we like and we choose to go in and take these things on because they're part of our environment. And if what I said earlier is that everything that we do represents our environment and it's a constant story, that means that for many tribes, even their origin stories that they would tell today would include a cell phone. People don't want to hear that. They're like, but I want the traditional American Indian story from, you know, long ago and, you know, and all these, and it's like, but we're still alive and we're not living in the past. We live now. And it's, a, as it says up here, 
well, they're <laughs> living traditions. And so to answer your question, we've had virtual powwows online. People coming in and everybody, as you see some of your friends in the videos, and we're going to a powwow that somebody hosts and how they host it, it's up to them. Sometimes it's pretty cool. Sometimes it's, but you know, we're folks. Um, but we've even, I've even gotten dressed with my family, my, my wife and my daughter, and we've danced in our living room, watching our brother, you know, my brother and his wife and his daughter dancing. And we had our, just a mini powwow between ourselves because we need to dance. Sometimes you can go to people who are in medicine, um, you know, MDs and uh, homeo you know, homeopaths, others that would say, why are you doing these things? Why do you have these ailments and things like that? When was the last time you danced? Because we know you're a dancer. I'm like, it's been a year and a half since I've danced. They're like, I think you need to start dancing again. Uh, it's kind of like athletes who run 10 miles a day and then autom autom automatically quit. And they don't run the 10 miles anymore. And then they get sick. They have something that happens to their body. So mm -hmm. our bodies are shaped by what we feed it, what we feed it, and how we practice using our bodies um, mentally, spiritually, physically. All the things that seem to be catchphrases in the past 10, 20 years about uh, life, body, spirit, mind, something, I don't know, they're, they're always different ones. And so powwows are coming back and then they get canceled because they wanna be appropriate, you know, and, and uh, the, the, this pandemic this past year, year almost year and a half, um, has really hit a lot of tribes hard. There was the Zuni tribe who almost went extinct because their numbers are so small. So when we're talking about a tribe, many tribes have 100 to 1,000 members. Some tribes have 10 to 20,000 members. The largest tribe might have 250,000 members, but many tribes out of 576 have numbers that are so low that it's very possible for them to go extinct mm -hmm. from a pandemic like this. And because of lack of resources, you know, going into those uh, uh, those reservations and things. And again, that's a longer description. It's not so simple as like government, tribe, state. Okay, well, they should just do. It's very, very complex. Um, so that would be like another hour and a half for me to explain that one. Um, but tribes, you know, just like people, people, you know, folks um, are resilient. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I remember a woman, uh, Joanna Highgood, who did a performance at uh, uh, Jacob's Pillow and I saw the video of it. She goes, hey, even during slavery, we we're making babies. We we're still dancing. I mean, a form of resistance, if that's what you want to call it, if that's kind of your, your uh, platform, is to continue celebrating this one degree that comes from the top to the bottom of the earth or the center of the earth. This one degree I can handle. I can handle and 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 worship and 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 live by rather than 360 around pulling and pushing and pulling and pushing, and if we can do that, then it it, it might turn out to be okay because the sun rises every day and sets and comes back again. Winter comes, things die. Spring comes, they're all reborn. It's all the circle and the cycle that that universal symbol of the circle. Yes, thank you. Wow, wow. <laughs> That is that. Um, yes, all of that. And yes, um, I had a question. Um, we talked about um, we've already talked, touched on tradition and, and the living tradition and um, the kind of like how things evolve um, based on the environment and what is happening and what is current. Um, can you talk about um, the art, I guess is what I want to say, the term art and performance. Ooh. Yes, performance and and art and All what, right. yeah. All right, I might have to pop my knuckles for this one. Oh. Okay, <laughs> pop them, come on. Um, you know, it, it's, again, we're using, the, you're asking me about the word art and the word performance. And the academic in me wants to be like, mm, we're gonna de deconstruct these words and etymology and um, You know, this is gonna sound like I'm the, uh, like the cliche bumper sticker Indian that says life is art. <laughs> but I mean, it really is in essence that, I mean, it really, you know, somebody, I remember somebody talking about American Indian religion and philosophy and I teach that class at the university, and I said, well, there's no such thing as a religion and philosophy. American Indians don't have that. Half the students are really disappointed because they're like, oh, but I thought I was gonna learn about. Um, but it's the way you live your life. And so prayer is everywhere, all day, every day. 
ceremony is all day, every day. Art is all day, every day. And when you talk to me about art, we're going to have about three different conversations by definition. Which one do you mean? The one that's being sold? That's the ones that's being bought? The one that represents, uh, you know, a ceremony, a, a culture, who's doing it, the authenticity of who's doing it. Um, there, there's there's so much that's in the living tradition. Again, you, you, your title is was is perfect because it's a living tradition. Um, the performance, it's 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 a performance that the audience sees, but it's ceremony that the dancers doing on stage. And so, you know, many people who've gotten to know me backstage, you know, I'm in prayer, you know, even for those music festivals, I was in prayer, you know, beforehand. And again, prayer. So what does that mean? What are you doing? What What is your practice in the prayer? You know what? Let, let me show you a prayer really, really quick. Okay, let's keep going. It's just the acknowledgement that I am part of, and all these things are part of, it's symbiotic right it's it's a uh, it's internal it's external it's macro it's micro it's everything that science teaches us anyway between mitosis krebs cycle fission fusion all these different things in science are the same things that we believe already we just didn't you know write it down um and so the performance it's really really difficult to say that there's a performance when the the dance embodies the the spirituality and the 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 story without it being mentally processed during the dance. So when I'm dancing, I'm not going, I'm doing this for the ancestors. I'm, I'm telling the story of the bear. I'm, I'm, you know, you become and you just do. And when it becomes a practice, it's kind of like when people talk about working out or a diet or, you know, showing up to work and, you know, in full mind, you have to practice it. You have to make it more consistent and it just becomes, you know, like muscle memory. Well, if from the day you're born to the day you die, from the time you wake to the time you sleep is all prayer and art and performance, then it's no longer any of those things. It's your living tradition. Um, I'm working on a dissertation <laughs> for your question. So when I get the answer in three years, I'll let you know. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That, that, um, so good. Would, would you be willing to share a little bit of your tradition with us? Yes. Um, so here's what I'll say as my disclaimer. Um, you know, for many groups, for many uh, cultures, you know, the dance is done in an appropriate manner, in an appropriate way, in an appropriate space and place with the appropriate people around. Um, so if you're to go to powwow, you can come see a grass dancer and a grass dancer. Um, many stories... <clears throat> would say, you know, well, something like this is what a traditional grass dancer would look like, you know, a hundred years ago. Very, very, you know, bare in what they're wearing, but what they are wearing is necessary to tell the story and, and for the purpose. So in the Northern Plains, you have these men coming in to clear the grass, to, to make an arena for a ceremony or celebration. Uh, they move the grass down, they flatten it with their feet so that when they leave, the grass grows again and it's still there so you didn't destroy the environment for your need and purpose. Um, the grass is laid down and it's two grass dance songs to a drum beat. The drum beat represents the heartbeat. So it's the heartbeat of all living things around us, above, and, above us and below us. I'm talking fast to get through this really quick. The grass dancers come in, they lay the grass down very beautifully. Uh, today you'll see grass dancers, beautiful dancers, intricate dancers with lots of yarn or ribbon on their outfits, their regalia. Um, and I was told, and not all dancers are taught the same way, but I was told that dancers were to do everything in symmetry, meaning Everything their right foot does or left foot does, everything their left foot does or right foot does, and they, they go on from there. And so let's say, for example, you're at home and nobody's watching, and you're like, well, I kind of want to do this grass dance thing. Well, then just use your hands. Okay, let's make a shape. Circle. All right. Circle. All right. Triangle. 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 Square. Square. All right. Now start doing letters. All right. Um, B. Well, it has to be a backwards B. All right, um, C, well, it has to be a backwards C. Now start doing numbers, letters, shapes. Now imagine doing it to a song, maybe your first, second, or third song in a competition after three days of dancing all day and all night out in Arizona in the summer, and now you're dancing to a drum, singing a song you'd never heard before, and now your feet have to do the same thing, right? These are just simple things. 
but eventually you might want to go forward, back, side, in, forward, back, side, in, this, tap, sideways, side, in, this, tap, side, right? So whatever you choose to do at home when nobody's watching and just to have fun and kind of have a balance in your life, Maybe practice doing something like that. I wouldn't go to a powwow and tell everybody you're a grass dancer or that Eddie Madrill taught you how to grass dance and now you can. I wouldn't do that. But practice the symmetry, the balance of your life, that everything is about posture, about balance in the way you move. If you, if you can't walk, use your feet, use your eyes, use you know your drawings, just to have that, that balance of symmetry. And so that dance can just kind of go around, you know, kind of, Low movement, kind of coming around. Low movement again, coming around. Oftentimes, dancers will favor one leg, especially when you go out on a Saturday night, you favor one leg and you forget the other one. So grass dance is one thing we do. Now, some of you have seen hoop dance, some great hoop dancers all around the, the country. Um, not everybody hoop dances, not all tribes hoop dance. There's stories that say the hoop dance was created for children to build dexterity when they're climbing up to their homes in the cliff dwellings. They would use hoops to be able to go through and then climb the walls of these cliffs whenever they're being chased by animal or by enemy. Some say that the dance was created specifically as a healing ceremony dance to heal people who are sick. So the dance is also a story of creation. It's a dance that uh, builds dexterity, um, hand-eye coordination, it also tells the beginning of life into this world, and then it goes on. I'm not going to do the hoop dance for you now, but you can watch different hoop dancers telling their story in different ways. We're all taught different things. But what you can do if you choose to just kind of practice a little bit of hoop dance at home, again, I'm not giving permission for people to take the dances and go out and perform them or do them at powwows and things. But let's say you have a hoop, a small one. It's relative to your size. You might have a hoop. And I was told that the hoop starts off from the floor or the ground, and then you pick it up with your feet because we didn't create all things here on earth. So we have to put one foot in, the other one steps, rolls, and kicks. It catches the hoop. Then you slide it up. Let me give you a better view here. All right. So you put one foot in the center, one foot on the hoop, you don't put your heel down, you don't squish it, you just roll it. You roll it, and you catch it. Oftentimes people will think that they're supposed to kick up, but you'll never catch it that way. So step, roll, kick forward, you grab it right here, and you slide it up. Now once you get it over your head, this is when you can start doing things like put it between your feet. Put one foot through, the other foot through, the other foot through, the other foot through. Practice working on just the smoothness of being able to put your foot through, maybe without looking, going down, pointing your feet, then going backwards perhaps. Once you've done this for a long time, maybe then you can run forward or backwards. If you have a hoop in front of you, put it over your head, behind your knees, and then you dive through the hoop. Let's try that again. Hoop, up to your chest, over your head, behind your knees, and your head comes down towards your knees. Now if you want to be really fancy, you can go backwards. Again, kind of like that balance. Put it behind you. You can hold it with two hands if you choose. I tend to hold it with one hand because this one hand is going to go right behind my knees, and then I'm going to flip it over my head, stand up, and take it out. We'll try that one more time. Behind the knees, up to my chest, flip it out. So what it ends up looking like is And there you go. So that's one way of doing hoop dance as far as picking it up from the beginning and then going from there.
Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, that was amazing. I I I I, I always find it. I, I've been very lucky and privileged to have been able to see you uh, do this dance on a number of occasions, and it, it never fails but to really, it's very moving. Well, I would say the same about both of you. <clears throat> Dancers who bring the spirit and the culture and the tradition and the heritage and the history and the future of that dance onto the stage and just, you know, a dancer doesn't have to be so dynamic. A, dynancer, a, di a dancer just has to be dynamic. <laughs> And so, you know, I think through the, the teachings of my elders, my very tough parents, my other tough parents and my other tough parents and grandparents and aunties and everybody who's watching because your culture, your, your whole people, your whole community watches, you know, from a distance and hears and watches and hears. And so social media was taking place way before electronic social media. And so everybody knows whether or not you're doing the right thing and you get to, you go through different stages in your life. When I was eight, learned I was native, started dancing, woo, started dancing really good, woo, started winning competitions, woo, and then you have to look back and go, wait, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? And start realizing a little bit more about not just the Indian, but your tribe and your tribal ways. And then you start, you know, it's just the process you start learning. It's like being an intern in life and then start learning a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more throughout. So, yeah. Thank you. We have a question from um, Baba CK, uh, Baba CK, is, um, he's in, he's encountered more often the question of cultural appropriation in social media whenever, um, he's posted a video that may include a diverse population. Do you encounter the question of cultural appropriation and how do you deal with it? Whew. Um, man. You know, cultural appropriation is kind of a, a kind of a one of those. I don't want to say catchphrases right now. It's kind of a, I don't want to say trending either. It's been around. It's just that it's more prevalent now. Um, it's the first thing that people go to, you know, when when you're and it's kind of like when it's a kind of a trigger reaction. You know, when I danced on stage at a music festival, um, it was a long process. And I mean, in one of I mean, there's there are so many reasons why I didn't want to do it. I don't want to go dance at you know. Coachella or Lollapalooza, why would I be doing that to DJ music? But you know, the DJ was a uh, is is native and uh, native Hawaiian, Native American, uh, Native Filipino, and um, you know, I, I my my first reaction was no, there's no way because that's the one place that people can't stand if you're native because of all the people going with headdresses and this and that. And, um, but it was a long conversation, and so my 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 answer was yes. But I talked to this one man who is no longer with us. And uh, he said, and he was Chinese, so he's not even American Indian. So our wisdom doesn't come from only American Indian people. Our wisdom comes from the wise who are universal everywhere, um, including people like CK who has taught me things. Um, but, you know, this man said, well, Eddie, those, those, those music festivals, I mean, that's like church. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? How could you even, of course, I didn't do that. I just went like this, mm-hmm, and he just listened. He said, those are a bunch of young people coming together to congregate, to, to feel good. They might not be making a lot of the best decisions, but they're going there for the purpose of feeling good. So in a sense, that's like church. They're going there to feel good, and you're going to go there and make them feel good, and they're going to have questions. They're going to learn about you and learn about American people. And, you know, and I asked the DJ, I said, hey, you know, if anybody starts asking you, you know, what was that and why that and this, I said, you have them ask me. You know, you don't you don't answer that question. You know, you answer questions about their music. I'm the dancer. You have them ask me. So cultural cultural appropriation, I think, is just that that instance when you do something or when you see somebody doing something um, that is stealing. I mean, cultural appropriation is in 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 all intents and purposes stealing because you're using something without permission, and and permission isn't just something that is given. I mean, you know, I might teach American Indian studies at a university, but that that shouldn't make the students trust that I'm the right American Indian person to be studying or, or, or teaching American Indian studies. And it almost seems contradictory, but here's the thing. Not all American Indian people are, are, are great and good and perfect. Nobody from any culture, you know, can say that all people from that culture are good. And, per and I think some people have this, this preconceived notion that American Indians are so beautiful and they're all, you know, great, but there might be some wrong ones 
And what if I'm that wrong one teaching this class? Because I've seen people teaching a class. And I'm like, they're native, but they're not saying the right thing. They're not. How do you what do you do? Um, so cultural appropriation gets sticky. But when it's very apparent and overt, and you have to call it out. Otherwise, it's somebody who gets away with something. And we're learning a lot about that these days. You can't just do something and say, well, everybody else has gotten away with it for a long time. So why can't I? Um, <laughs> so that being said, CK, uh, it, 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 it's kind of a, a base, you know, it's on a, a, a basis to basis. What do you call that? Um, it's on a case by case. There we go. A case by case scenario, because uh, there's so many things like we were talking about nuance earlier. It, it can be really complicated. Um, I have to just I have to as an academic, I have to sit there and just ask more questions who, what, when, where, how, why, and then ask all those questions again one or two more times. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we, we have another um, comment question from Fabricio Breeze Olsen, and says, love you, Eddie. Mahalo and aloha from Saki, Breeze and Tandy from Santa Cruz. You are light and brilliant. This evening has been a joy. What is next for you or your company? Anything we can witness or join? Ooh, well, um, Leo Sanchano Bo to all of you um, and your family. So, Chocuatesia, Chocuatesia, Chocuatesia. Uh, thank you, thank you. I never know. Um, you know, recently we had to put our performances on video um, for some of the theaters and, and uh, that, that we had you know, we had already booked to do performances, live performance for school kids, for families. Um, and so we had to, you know, coordinate it into a video. Um, right now, it would just be a matter of, of waiting to, you know, for the next Bay Area powwow. We tend to go to those a lot. So if you ever see me, just come by and say hi. If I look like I'm, you know, not paying attention, it's because I need to be paying attention to what's happening in the powwow because something might be taking place that I need to go attend to. But other than that, um, you, if you see me here, I'm a, this is my close up. Come say hi um, and tell me how we met. Um, but no, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's always best just to look up, you know, saywamdance.com. Um, we're not always, you know, doing things for the public. A lot of times it's for, you know, um, you know, schools. So we can't invite people. We don't do a lot of stuff um, on big stages all the time. Um, so, you know, find us there, check us out and, and go support all, you know, go support all ethnic dance, you know, support living traditions, support World Arts West. And, you know, you can always uh, look through them uh, to find out more stuff that's happening, um, yeah, I, I never know. We don't have one of those uh, one of those uh, interns in our office making bookings all the time. <laughs> but thank you for asking. You're welcome. I have I have another question. Earlier, you did a couple of gestures um, when you were speaking. Can you speak to that and like how, and and how and if they're used within the dance form? Wow, Latanya! Wow. You know, amongst Native people, we tend to joke about, "Oh, hunter gatherer, you must be a hunter gatherer." All right, so with all, you know, with close to two hundred languages in the in the Central Plains, especially, but in other places across the country, there is sign language, and uh, depending which tribe you are, you might have a different symbol for. Like, let's say this is friend. This is me and a friend walking through life. In another tribe, it might be you know close together. You know, they're they're together like this. But the sign language um, is a way that people would communicate when they saw each other, when they are crossing paths, perhaps, or traveling on the same trails. When the buffalo moved and the people would move with the buffalo, they didn't always have horses, so they would still move their teepees, but teepees were shorter. So when we see teepees today going, well, how'd they move those huge things before the horse? Well, they weren't huge. They were smaller. They didn't, they didn't need to. Um, but sign language, um, it, it, it's utilized, it was utilized a lot. Um, it was taken down in late 1800s, I think around eight, between 1885 and 1887 is when the federal government had a lot of people going out like ethnographers to study everything about Indians they could because, well, it was expected that we were all going to be gone by 1900. So they were out, you know, getting all the photographs they could, getting all the ethnographers to study our language or sign language or diets or games or, you know, everything. Um, and so sign language kind of uh, it got stopped getting used, you know, because that's during the time of assimilation. They call it the assim assimilation period when you had the, you know, the, the allotment act when tribes were broken up into, you know, you know, landowners plots and then the boarding schools. And, you know, it, I mean, it just goes on and on. Um, but sign language was prevalent. And there's many people today that um, 
use American Sign Language because of uh, hearing impairment and things, but uh, the American Indian Sign Language was one of those ways. So you would say things like, education is not the enemy. A weak or broken heart is the enemy. Stay strong in your love to the creator and you will be strong forever. I I could I I really wish we could just keep going for like another like week three days but um, but I think we we um, we should probably think about wrapping this up but Eddie I cannot thank you enough for for being here and for your energy and your love and you know all the things that you are um, you're very precious and thank you so 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 much for being here and sharing on living traditions. All my love to you both and everybody thank there you. at Polaris West, keeping keeping things going through a tumultuous time. Um, so thank you, Chokwetesia, Chokwetesia, Chokwetesia to all, everybody. Everybody watching, you know, taking your time to, you know, come and watch and uh, learn from different people. Uh, tonight, me, but uh, in other series and other uh, episodes, different uh, culture bearers. So thank you to all of you for inviting me and and uh, trusting that I'd come here to bring something to all of you. So thank you and thank you. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank our viewers for joining us today and uh, to those who submitted questions. And um, before I um, uh, reintroduce our, our executive director and Huang, I would just like to mention that we are going to be back again on the third Tuesday of May at 7.30 with another episode of Living Traditions. So thank you again uh, on behalf of my, my esteemed co-artistic director, Latanya Tigner. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring back Anne Huang. Wow. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you so much, Mahea and Latanya. I, I too wish that we could go for an entire week. This was so informative. I took lots and lots of notes. <laughs> it was just so, so, um, so amazing. Um, for everybody who's watching, if you do enjoy this program, please consider making a donation to World Arts West. Um, like Mahe said, Mahea said, we will be back again in May. And please go to worldartswest.org to sign up on our mailing list for further information. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And we will see you again in May. <laughs>